afternoon, everyone. Um, I just first like to say it's it's a real privilege and an honor to be here. Um, I wanted to acknowledge uh, when I look out in the room here, I see a lot of familiar faces, and I know that any every single one of you could be up here right now presenting on your experiences, your knowledge, um, and some of the uh, approaches that you have developed in your in your work and elsewhere in your communities. So, um, like I said, it's it's uh, it's been a really uh, 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 interesting and and uh, uh, a journey at this to this point, and and I really just wanted to uh, say what a what an honor and privilege it is to be here. Thanks. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with a little bit of background here, and I mean little bit. I'm actually going to pare it down because I know it's been uh, the topic of much discussion already today, um, which brings me to another acknowledgement. Um, there's a lot of diversity um, in this room. There's a, there's a lot of experience um, in professional and, and community life that we all have. And collectively, um, I just wanted to acknowledge that, you know, just in wearing this badge um, and your name tag, that we are, we are all part of a community here. And so uh, when you look at the, you know, the title of this workshop and all the work that went in and, and the uh, uh, bringing together of people and knowledge, you know, th this is, uh, we are a community that, that is very uh, interested and uh, I would say passionate on some levels, uh, you know, with, with this issue because at the heart of it and at the heart of the treaties and the work that we do, um, we're talking about livelihoods, economic livelihoods, you know, uh, traditional livelihoods, um, you know, th th these, these hit at the heart of, of, of families and well-being and, and all of those things that are so important to everybody, um, you know. Um, so there. So uh, I'm going to also give a caveat to say that I'm not here in any official capacity uh, with my First Nation. I'm just speaking as a, as a, as a guy who's, who's done some stuff with other people doing stuff. And uh, so far, um, there's been a few things that I've picked up on. And so, uh, you know, hitting into the rough, as, uh, as uh, Andrew noted, and, and uh, you know, some of the other uh, presenters here is, is certainly part of the journey. So, so I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, this, this portion of the presentation, I'm, I'm actually going to read. Uh, but then the, once I get into uh, further slides, I'm, I'm not going to. And the reason is, is because this, another caveat here, uh, this is, uh, you know, many people have many uh, opinions and there's a lot of history. And I don't want to get into uh, uncomfortable uh, issues or controversial issues. At, at, you know, I'm just presenting on some of the things we've learned. Um, so you can see here, this is a treaty medallion. This is uh, commemorative of, uh, to the Indian chiefs of, of uh, signature to the treaties. Um, I'm going to pare it down. But I'm going to read one really uh, key point, um, which is, I think, kind of the, one of the foundations of, of what allows us to be together in this room and, and what allows us to have uh, the roles in, in society and, and the, the, the livelihoods that we do. <clears throat> um, treaty rights. And Her Majesty the Queen hereby agrees with the said Indians that they shall have the right to pursue their usual vocations of hunting, trapping, and fishing throughout the tract surrenders as heretofore described, subject to such regulations as may arise from time to time by the government of the country acting under the authority of Her Majesty, and saving and accepting such tracts as may be required or taken up from time to time for settlement, mining, lumbering, trading, or other purposes. So we've got hunting, trapping, fishing, We've got settlement, including lumbering. So in one paragraph in Treaty Number 8, sets those foundational, um, uh, sets foundations for uh, where we've got to today. Um, from what I've heard some from my elders uh, and my own experience as well, uh, the treaties created an ideological space, or an opportunity at least for that space, uh, for peace, uh, peaceable relationships between the First Nations and, and newcomers, founded on the principles of honesty, law, respect, acceptance, 
and reconciliation, and I would also add sharing um, <clears throat> in a peaceable way. Uh, from some perspective, the treaties were agreements of peaceful coexistence and sharing. Um, it was likely assumed at that time that the areas were so geographically huge and the resources so plentiful as to be uh, virtually inexhaustible. And so um, I, would, I would guess that they may not have been able to predict where we are at the present day with, with technology, with globalization, with you know, um, you know the the in information age automation uh, that you know these kind of developing these activities that were spoken to uh, in the treaties would would become uh, so uh, uh, I would say in intense and and widespread. Um, so you know this has what it's done. These things over time have have increased the number of interactions between what were supposed to be the signatories of the treaty doing their different things um, and never the two shall meet and uh, interact, that there was just enough of everything. So what we've got now is, is uh, you know, the, the Crown uh, uh, has the right to take up lands for development and settlement. Um, First Nations hunt, trap, and fish. Um, and there's also, you know, uh, how that has evolved into the present day is something that uh, you know is a matter of, of uh, debate, conjecture, uh, and with you know deep respect and humility, uh, it's a very important topic, and it needs to be continually to be ex explored. Uh, but I'm not going to go there. Um, so I'm going to fast forward a little bit to the Constitution Act of 1982, um, and this is uh, <clears throat> where the federal government enshrined the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and also completed its, uh, our independence from Britain. So this is uh, r really important because the Canadian, Canadians can now, since then, uh, amend the Constitution on our own without approval from uh, overseas. So the, the Constitution did many things, including uh, putting resource development uh, it, you know, in, in the, uh, as a provincial uh, uh, jurisdiction and responsibility. Uh, but it also enshrined the Section 35 treaty rights in a manner that, in a section that is not within the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So um, it's important to note that <clears throat> the Charter of Rights and Freedoms can be, there's a clause in there that government can temporarily, temporarily suspend Charter Rights and Freedoms if given sufficient um, and necessary cause. Uh, but the Section 35 rights are not within that. And so they cannot be simply overridden, and they cannot be set aside. So that's also important. Here's section 35. This begins part two of the Constitution Act. Um, and I'm not going to read that because you're fully capable as, as learned individuals, highly trained as well. Um, so we've got um, <clears throat> that while the Section 35 recognizes and affirms treaty rights, it doesn't define them. These are not, these are not defined. It doesn't give you a recipe. It doesn't give you a list. Um, and that's the source of the evolution of, you know, where we are today in terms of consultation, in terms of, uh, you know, these formative uh, court, uh, court decisions, you know, um, which actually kind of, originated within forestry on the West Coast and First Nations uh, concerns. And so um, the evolution of the duty to consult, you know, the definition, the concepts of the honor of the crown, um, these type of things, the uh, evolution of common law and court decisions where uh, the, you know, the, there's a, a spectrum, if you will, of the, uh, of the, um, the depth or the, the degree of consultation required. So on a low end note, uh, notification uh, could be sufficient if there is a, you know, a low impact or if, if the uh, treaty rights or the claim is, uh, is low, the strength of the claim is low. And it goes up into uh, medium range and then up into deep consultation. 
where there is the possibility for accommodation that's required. So there's definitely a spectrum there. Um, in, in most, I would say, at, to my knowledge, uh, within Alberta, um, it's it's completely there's universal coverage of treaties. So the the strength of the claim is already established, and so the primary indicator then is the uh, potential for uh, adverse uh, impact to the rights. And so that's what we're um, gauging the uh, consultation requirements. I'm not going to go into Alberta's consultation process. Um, my presentation is actually focused on some things that you might do before you get there. So um, as you all know, the, uh, uh, in a provincial context, uh, the Forestry Act um, is, the uh, is AG4, Ministry of Indigenous Relations, Alberta Consultation Office, and then there's possibly some other um, regulatory uh, statutory decision makers that might be brought in depending on the nature of the activities. But I'm not going to go into that anymore. So as we are talking about consultation, I wanted to share with you this. I found this cartoon uh, about 10 years ago when I first, when I just graduated university and I started getting into um, working with uh, uh, consultants and, and uh, First Nations and industry and government. And um, I'm not going to analyze this. I think it speaks well on its own. Um, so there are some, you know, different perspectives on consultation and what it is. I wasn't sure I was going to include this slide because I don't want to sound preachy to anybody, but these are some of the things that from my own experience that in tough situations, controversial situations, um, we heard some um, examples of controverse, controversial, and I don't want to say controversial in the fact that we should be shying away from them or, uh, you know, uh, discounting them or avoiding them. These are important. These are extremely important because it's exploring those discrepancies. It's exploring those spaces in between where these words are coming from that I think uh, some of the solutions can be found from my experience. And so when I was thinking about some of the tough situations I've been in with government industry, you know, I've, I've, with lawyers and, and it some of these uh, places, these are some of the uh, allies, if you will, archetype kind of allies that you can, you know, uh, have some ideal and, and fall back upon if, if you're in a tough spot. And so, you know, that goes for me, and I'm sure others have similar strategies dealing with tough situations. So here's a bit of a secret. Um, it's not a complete secret. Uh, we heard a presentation from uh, Andrew and, and uh, we heard some others. And I also personally know, because I'm involved with them, of other really, really well thought out and, and genuine examples of, of planning. So identifying traditional knowledge, uh, you know, incorporating those into draft plans, uh, co uh, jointly developing strategies to avoid, mitigate, reduce, accommodate. You know, these are some of the things, and, and uh, you know, there's some people in the room I'm, I'm looking at, I know directly involved, so uh, those are much appreciated. The secret is, is basically the more planning you do, you know of have a good idea of what you're going to do you don't need to know exactly every last detail but in having those discussions early on and just sharing information sharing um, one of the collaboration tables that we were uh, involved with at the uh, Northwest uh, planning uh, that 
Tolko was involved with as well was about exploring and pursuing. You don't need a formal table to explore and pursue opportunities for meaningful engagement and developing strategies to have some meaningful outcomes. More planning, more time, more information sharing, less consultation needed. So once you get to that stage where you have to engage with uh, the ministries on uh, you know, who, how, do you, how they will delegate to you on fulfilling their undelegable duty to consult, I'm, <laughs> I could go into that. I'm not going to. So, so here we go. Here's, here's some planning approaches. And this is in no way, this is not a stepwise, uh, you know, one, two, three, follow this and you're, you're in the clear. Um, and any of these steps in here could be rearranged probably. They could also be, um, they could also uh, be intermittently applied or it could be a cyclic uh, type of process. It's, it's a, a dynamic um, place that we're in. So companies, <clears throat> you can draft your plans. It's great. Whatever you got, good enough. Bring it. Predict some potential uh, outcomes. So if we do this, what could happen to that? Um, so including when you present, if you come into a community and you say, hey, we, we want to get some, uh, we want to talk to you guys before we uh, you know, have to submit our application on this stuff, you're going to hear a lot of what hasn't worked. Or maybe there was a, a deficit in the communication that you're you know, now trying a different approach and you're going to go and do more planning instead of 11th hour stuff. You're going to hear a lot of what hasn't worked. And these are really um, emotional at times, and, and rightly so. I would say rightly so. When you hear about cabins getting clear cut around, uh, people that are no longer able to uh, hunt, fish, and trap in areas that they prefer, that are suitable, and that are sufficient for them. And they've invested a lot of time and resources and, and, uh, and their own culture and families. You know what I mean? Like these, these this is the sum of where uh, these uh, very uh, passionate uh, uh, places, um, I think, I think, come from. <clears throat> so there's I identify traditional use activities and values. There's some of the things you can do, incorporate. <clears throat> there's a bit of a mitigate. There's a meaningful outcome process. It loosely. Ideally, you want to avoid. So this could be dropping blocks. You might, you found out there's a cabin there. You could drop the block. You could. That's a void. Uh, you could alter the blocks. You could develop some type of agreed upon um, buffer zone, if you will, that can that would protect the values at that site. Um, what we're finding is, um, you know, the mitigation continuum. Uh, ideally avoid, mitigate, reduce, offset. And where you can't do all those things, maybe there's some accommodation, which could include uh, you know, altering burning practices or, or addressing some of these other um, concerns. Not all of the concerns fit within the scope of the application. <clears throat> there's, there's areas that you need to have which are more policy, guideline, OGR, directives, you know, kind of overarching things that are issues. They are issues with the program, but things that are not necessarily actionable within the regulatory regime and the consultation process. We certainly know of many examples. Um, doing this work I found I have to be a, almost an eternal optimist uh, because uh, a lot of the um, <clears throat> outcomes at times are not meaningful. Um, they're unilateral. They're not participatory. They're imposed. And those type of things are hard to swallow, especially when you know uh, one group of society is benefiting more than another, and then the costs are being borne by 
you know, the other more uh, dis uh, disproportionately. And those type of things are, are uh, concerning, especially when uh, being as a community member and you go, when you go to someone's house in our community, um, <clears throat> you'll notice the freezers are full of wild meat and berries and harvested things off the landscape. And uh, I'll tell you why uh, many of the politicians that are elected in communities are elected is because they're really key harvesters that follow the traditional ways. They provide for the community food security. They're bastions of culture, of knowledge, of language. These are the people um, that other community members want to represent them because of these issues are directly tied to their own livelihood. <clears throat> so it's important to track all those things that may be outside of an application or you know, an ACO consultation, but at a planning level where you're exploring and pursuing different things, these are as important, if not sometimes more important, these larger concerns. Okay, I'm getting five minute flag here. Um, so putting these aside doesn't mean you're not gonna, you're gonna forget about them. You wanna have more discussion. You wanna have some you know, brainstorming. How do you begin to pare these down into manageable pieces? How do you begin to um, look at some solutions? What types of solutions can you do as a, as a government, as a company, as a First Nation, as an individual to address some of these? So within the forestry context, um, you know, we've got some opportunities at the AOP, GEP, FMP, bilateral, um, you know, kind of MOU type or, or planning table, and then things that you might have other, other members of, uh, that are doing stuff on the landscape that are also concerned about that, and you can build these consensus, these multilateral groups that have the same concerns about the same issue. And so maybe you don't agree on everything all the time, which is almost impossible, I see, but uh, you know, just even to have that cohesion as taking one issue to the people that um, you know, can do something about it, including yourselves, and having that is, is really key. Um, you'll find that, uh, you know, here's some examples. So there's a, a, a trap line mitigation plan, if you will, that included the trapper going out, as a, a band member, going out, assessing an area that, that might be suitable to move his trap line to, going to where his trap line was, uh, is slated for development, moving stuff or collecting it, documenting the, the route, moving it over, um, and then having th the uh, commitment from the company that if he's going to do all this work and move it, that they're not going to come in in the next year or 10 or 20. They're going to leave him alone, go elsewhere. So this issue of elsewhere is super important because usually consultation is about where you cannot go anymore or where we're planning to go that's going to uh, affect you uh, adversely. So having a discussion of those elsewheres that are suitable, that are sufficient, that are preferred, where um, community, me community members can um, exercise their rights with quiet and peaceable enjoyment. Um, those type of things are super important. Um, I'm gonna wrap here, up here really quick. We've got <clears throat> the spectrum between every, anywhere, everywhere, anytime, all the time. And uh, how do you focus that into a right here and now? But you'll see there's extremes. So we heard examples of uh, you know, First Nations um, uh, saying that everywhere is important, and that's true. Uh, the ACO says, well, only, well, I don't want to put words in them. Uh, I just say some other perspectives and processes are designed around site-specific values. And you can think of it as, as a funnel, right? So you're looking at one side from a wide perspective, and then you have to narrow it down into a tiny spot. Or you could flip it around 
and look from the spot and look outward and you've got a much larger field of view. And so this is a good example of a, of a cabin site. You can't just protect the spot, you gotta protect the other areas around it that are, make that site uh, useful. <clears throat> um, here's approval conditions, I've got one minute left. Here's some examples. <laughs> uh, here's some of the things that we did. Um, I'll skip over those because uh, Andrew talked about some of them um, and others. Here's uh, Alberta culture stuff. You can do trap line cabin dispositions, LOCs. Uh, there's different types of protective notations, connotative, connotative notations and public dispositions. So some of the other things that fall outside the application, that fall outside even planning a project are these relationships that can become established between individuals most likely to be adversely affected within a community. So you can start to focus in on the people that are actually you know, gonna have the most effects on the ground, what's gonna happen with them, involve them. Um, some of these partnerships have resulted in, uh, uh, for my community, with CPAWS, and we've applied to uh, ECCC, the Nature Fund, successfully for two projects, Indigenous Guardians, and the uh, community nominated priority places. We've got uh, some funding uh, from uh, NRCAN to do some caribou stuff. We've got funding from uh, Env Environment and Parks managed through FRIA that we're gonna do some linear um, assessment. So uh, that's my presentation. There's a, there's a lot more I could have talked about. This was actually a process of narrowing down um, a few things out of you know many many things so I, I just wanted to tell you guys I actually bought the rights for the that cartoon for this <laughs> one time use one time use for you guys and uh, I just had to put it on the last slide so. <laughs> Thanks.